guys for tuning in and, and joining this webinar. I'm excited to be doing this one. I think the first one we ever did was on uh, a SQL, and I think we had Francisco on there as well. So it's uh, it's good to come full circle. Um, we've got uh, we've got some awesome presentations and an awesome webinar today. Um, minor logistics before we get started. This is being recorded. It will be available at the link afterwards, and then we'll also put it up on YouTube um, in in a day or two. Um, if you have questions, we will spend a lot of time answering the questions at the end. So please ask them in the little question mark box on the right. So if you look on the right, there's a chat, which you're in now, and then there's a box underneath it with a question mark. Please put your questions in there, upload the ones that you want to hear answered the most. Um, and in terms of schedule, what we're going to do is we're going to do um, three quick uh, three quick presentations and then Q&A for, for the rest of it. Um, that's pretty much the, the the introduction. So with that, maybe we can do quick intros uh, by everyone. My name my name is Harrison, uh, co-founder CEO of, of Langchain, and I will pass it on to Artem. Do you want to start? Yeah. Hi everyone. Really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Artem. I'm co-founder and CEO at Cube. Perfect. Uh, David. Hi everyone. I'm David, uh, co-founder and CEO at Delphi Labs. Francisco. Hey there. So my name is Francisco. I'm co-founder with Manu here at Pampa Labs, where we do LLM consulting, and we do quite a lot of LLM to SQL work. So really excited to be here. And last but not least, Manuel. Yeah, Francisco already presented uh, myself, but I'm co-founder with him at, at Pampa here doing consulting and also uh, contributing to Nineteen as well. Awesome. Let's jump right into it. Artem, do you wanna do you wanna take it away? Yeah, sure. Let's, let me share my screen here. Okay. You can see it all right. Yes. Yeah, I will do a quick introduction to the idea of semantic layer and a cube specifically, and then how it can be used uh, with with Lang chain and LLM based applications. And I think, you know, like uh, David from Delphi will chat more about the, you know, I'm sure about the benefits of that approach as well. But just kind of, you know, to set a stage, uh, what is semantic layer? Uh, semantic layer, uh, it's a middleware that sits between your data sources and your different applications. So you can think about it as a, the, analytical ORM that helps you to define metrics, properties of the data, sort of translate the database tabular data into more like meaningful business level uh, data. Um, it's uh, when you have that in your stack, your applications, including you know, your, maybe your Python Lang chain application, would not go to the data source directly, but would go through the semantic layer. And the benefits of having the semantic layer, as you can see them on a slide, like a data modeling, access control, caching, and API. I will talk more about data modeling just because I think that's a most relevant benefit to the sort of uh, text to SQL applications. Uh, but other benefits are including access control. That's like a possibility to centralize your access control coming from a different applications to the different data sources. Caching, just to speed up performance of different queries. And then finally, API. So for example, Cube supports REST API, GraphQL API, which can be used to embed well, like embedded analytics of front-end applications. And then we have a SQL endpoint, which can be used for BI tool or like AI agents and chatbots. So Overall, the, the data model, and that's probably where uh, we'll talk about the biggest benefits in AI stack. Data model is a way to create a context and to be able to provide later this context to the AI application. And when I say context, it's a way to describe what you actually have in your data. So think about you have a lot of tables in your data warehouse, in your database, and but then you wanted to sort of give it meaning, give it a context. like. What is the data is about? What like things, what a metrics this data have? What a relationship between different entities? So in Cube, it all, it's all about data sets or entities. And when you describe your data model, you create what we call a cube, which sort of represents an entity, like 
orders in e-commerce data or like users. And then you can say one user can have multiple orders. That's a relationship between them. And then you can say orders may have like a metric that would be called uh, bounce, like a cancellation rate, right? Or something like the amount, like the percentage of orders that being canceled. So you can kind of build in with this uh, approach, uh, creating multiple measures, multiple relationships and creating a data graph. And then you can take the data graph and expose it to the different tools, including kind of AI applications. And uh, as you can see, it's all like code based. So we at Kube, we really big believers in sort of a code first approach. So everything is a code based YAML. We support Python now as well. So, um, and it's all open source. So um, now probably I will talk a little bit about the why matters for AI stack. I think one of the problems that, you know, like we need to always kind of keep in mind when building text to SQL application is that we need to make sure that we provide enough context to the uh, LLM that they can generate the correct SQL queries. But we also need to be able to reduce the room for error, meaning that the simpler query should be, it's, it means a less error prone system is right. Like if you would require, you know, like to, for the simple answer to get a bunch of different joins, you know, like know how to avoid fan, fan outs or traps, right? Like then it would be really hard for the LLM system to generate very correct SQL for that. But if it's a SQL is going to be simple, it means it just is going to be more correct. So that's where like, two areas where like semantic layer can help. So the first area is that semantic layer can give that context to the LLM system. And the way we, we can do that is by uh, kind of going through the semantic layer and cube specifically to the meta endpoint, downloading the data, downloading all the description that I showed you, you can define any YAML code, right? Like what this metrics is about how this metric is connected to different metric, to different dimensions, what entities you have, how this entities are connected to each other. So you can just dump all that information uh, into, into text and then put it into your vector database, right? And then when you do a query, right, you can do in sort of in-context learning when you kind of send this query to LLM and provide all the relevant context to the, to the uh, system to generate the correct query. On sort of a second uh, part of the benefit is that now with that you don't with the semantic layer you don't have to query your warehouse directly. You can generate a SQL query that will, you will send to semantic layer, and that SQL query is going to be much much more simpler, uh, just because it doesn't need to know about all the hidden complexities of the different joins, metrics, how they've been calculated, all of this. So the query to semantic layer may be as simple as select, you know, like top most selling products. And it could be just two columns in a select statement. And then you know, underlying SQL could be really huge with doing a lot of joins and all of that. So that kind of creates the protection that in this case, your system, it doesn't need to know and it doesn't need to create all this like complex SQL and semantic layer in a cube itself, it's it's its job to create that complicated SQL and then to satisfy that result. So that is a high level uh, overview of how semantic layer can uh, can add value to the AI based stack. And then I we have, have a, I have a quick question actually uh, before sure. you move on. So for, uh, when you say kind of like read the semantic layer definitions for context, like the you know cube was around before LLMs. People were writing this before LLMs were interacting with it. Have you noticed like any, like are the definitions, the way that people write that, like the descriptions and so forth, do those generally translate pretty nicely to having LLMs interact with them? Um, or, ha or are there, are there, are you seeing people kind of like change them in some way so that LLMs can better kind of like query them? Uh, I don't think people change them um i think it's a real, would be a really good question to david also because i think i know i'm sure you you saw it a lot 
But I feel like if you give a human readable um, description to your metric and dimension, and that's sort of considered the best practice in the data world anyway, you wanted to create a catalog, you wanted to expose this data to, you know, like your people in a company to employees, so they understand it. So you try to give it a really good human readable name, and then it's actually really good for LLM as well. So you can just take it and give it to LLM. So it's not like you need to create something specific here. So I haven't seen people doing anything specific here, but you know, like maybe in some cases you would need to fine tune, but overall it just translates very well. Perfect, cool. Um, yeah, probably, you know, like I have really only one slide here, just a link to demo if anyone wants to try it. It's, it's a stream lead app that built with Langchain and Cube and, um, and sort of it's hosted on GitHub. So it's open source, like 100 lines of code, uh, but, I think that's it from my end. So, and I will just stop sharing now. Cool, awesome. And and I guess like uh, one more question. And again, maybe this is maybe this is better aimed at like David. So so I asked before about if people are writing descriptions for um, kind of like uh, 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 so, so that LMs can better understand the context. Are people doing the opposite and creating like different kind of like views or data models uh, specifically for some of these LLM applications? Like, are the LLM applications that are like chat over your data, do they require kind of like different queries than queries that people were, were, were doing previously? I'd say not really. Um, the thing that Archim described where if you make your semantic layer as, you know, clean and well described and less cluttered as possible. It, I mean, the way I describe it is if you made your semantic layer such that another industry expert who worked at, like a competitor could come and look at it and understand exactly what it means, that's the best way you could prepare it for an LLM because an LLM is kind of like an expert in all industries, right? But um, yeah, it's interesting as well that the idea of whether semantic layer was made for a chatbot. I mean, I guess Cube's heritage with Statsbot kind of makes it as if it was, but um, yeah, that's interesting. Very cool. Um, David, do you want to jump into your presentation? Yeah. Let me just share my screen. And reminder for people that if they have questions, um, throughout these, we're going to take a bunch of questions for everyone at the end. So throw them in the in the question chat on the right. Okay, I think everyone can see that. Yep. So I think a good starting point is what is Delphi, and I think you know, given we're so new, I think it's probably worth going into like who who is Delphi as well. So Michael and I are the co-founders of Delphi. Uh, we've both worked across different data teams, um, leading uh, data teams using semantic layers in the form of Looker as well. We've both uh, been part of the DBT community, which is how we met. Uh, and Michael also has uh, led data teams using uh, self-serve BI tools like Looker as well. And one of the things that we both saw was that data teams still really struggle with self-service. Um, we found even with something like Looker, which gives you like a point and click interface, it's still really, really difficult for, uh, stakeholders to self-serve and you have, uh, a huge amount of work that comes through as ad hoc and many stakeholders don't have the skill. They don't have the quantitative mindset or the will or the time to use them. So they'd reach out to people like Michael and I instead. And, you know, this results in a two-sided problem, data teams who feel harassed and unable to do what they really want to do, whether that's deeper, answering deeper questions or um, what in investing in their infrastructure to also better, better answer questions in the future. And stakeholders have to wait a really long time. Sometimes they wouldn't get answers at all if what they asked for wasn't aligned with their OKRs. And, you know, generally speaking, both sides were unhappy and are still unhappy if you speak to a lot of these teams uh, with what, with the way things are. And, you know, invariably, because of how difficult it is to find things, you end up with this dashboard bloat in something like Looker, because when people can't find things, they just recreate them. 
going to Delphi, what we're trying to build at Delphi is an AI powered data platform specifically for non-technical users. So what we're trying to do is to use AI to answer simple to moderate complexity data questions. You know, that quick data pool, quick answers for, for and you know, these actually make up the majority of data requests today from our experience. And so we aim to quickly and easily, and most importantly, safely answer these questions. And you know, we want to augment data teams and build on the work they've already done and not pretend we could replace them. And this is why we want to integrate with semantic layers. And you know, you've probably seen many tools out there which try and solve the same problem that we do. Many of them are using an approach that I describe as text to SQL. And this is where an LLM is used to generate SQL directly from a database schema. And essentially here, the LLM is generating a semantic layer on the fly for each request. And so what it's doing is it's interpreting the meaning of the data and how it fits together with little to no human intervention. And it's our opinion that this is not going to work for enterprise BI and analytics use cases. And that data teams and stakeholders need to govern what that data means. And this should not really change very often and be consistent from request to request. And this is why we started with semantic layers from the very outset. So from the first prototype that Michael built, we've always built on top of semantic layers. We generate semantic layer API requests using our prompt engineering. And for us, semantic layers are where the meaning of data is defined and governed by their data teams. And so for us, LLMs are the other piece of the solution with semantic layers to enable self-service with data. So with Delphi, stakeholders can answer questions in natural language as if they were talking to an analyst. You can just ask Delphi instead of asking David or ping, ping Delphi on Slack instead of David and get a safe response. And the other thing that we find really helpful is that data teams can really understand quickly and easily what Delphi has generated because we don't generate SQL and because the semantic layer is not being generated on the fly. You can just see a simple semantic layer API request, much like a cube REST API request, validate it that it's answering the question. That's like a 10 second job versus trying to uh, validate some machine generated SQL, which could take a lot longer. And to be honest, if it was me, I would just chuck it and write my own SQL. And I think most analysts would probably do that. So Delphi use Langchain. Langchain provides a unified interface for every LLM provider we might want to work with. And we work with uh, Anthropic, OpenAI, GCP, and we have some open source hosted ones as well. And the reason why this is really helpful for us is we work in an enterprise setting where our customers might be particular about which LLM we use. And then we don't have to do extra work to support this every time we want to change which LLM we're using. And Langchain has a really helpful lot of abstractions over language models, chaining, memory, prompt addition over thread, to DB integrations. So we can use Langchain to do like various operations. That's, yeah, that's what I had to say. Uh, any questions? Um, so so I, I have one kind of about the types of questions that you see people asking. And I think previously you described it as kind of like uh, easy to medium kind of like difficulty questions. Yeah. What, what exactly does that mean? And like, if it is a hard level question, like, what do you do then? So like with a hard level question, I don't expect that an LLM would be able to answer it today or even in the, in the near term. So I'm talking, when I say a hard level question, there's like typically like strategic questions. So for example, when I worked at List, we had different products that we would merge to show people like the best price for the same product in different retailers. And like one of the deeper questions that we answer as a data team is, should we, should we continue to merge products? Is this a good idea for our business? Like, that is such a complicated question to answer and how like it has so many different steps and waiting and it's just not something that, you know, something like Delphi could ever really uh, answer, well, at least at this level of technology. 
Um, so that's what I mean by a hard question. And that's where I think you still need a data team. You still need those senior analysts who are that consultative partner to your business. And, and what we really hope is that with Delphi in place, that those people have more time to do that work and aren't just being like shoulder tapped or pinged on Slack all the time for small things. Do you do you do anything in in the Delphi um, bot to basically if someone asks a question like that, do you say like, hey, you know, we can't really answer that, or what happens if I if I were to ask the Delphi bot that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what would happen today is uh, Delphi would probably say, uh, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer this question, uh, and then we have a configuration in when you, when you set up our app that let you choose like a help channel or a help person. And that's usually like the data team channel or something like that. And then the then that they'll be alerted to the fact that this question has been asked and they can either help Delphi come to a better answer through wording the question differently, or they'll just take it away and answer it in something else like hex or count or something like that. Very cool. Yeah, I like I like the idea of like human in the loop as a way to augment. Hundred kind percent. Of yeah. yeah. Do you do that? Like another another way that we've thought about this in a little bit for like chat. So we have like chat lang chain, which is a chat bot over our documentation. And one of the things that we want to do more of is like figure out um, what types of questions people are asking. So then we can like improve documentation there or something. Do you have any type of like analytics to provide like what types of queries people are asking so that you can? I, I don't know what the action item would be. So maybe it's not a perfect parallel, but I'm curious if there's anything. Yeah, so this is a question we've been asked a few times. It's, and it, we actually have the data, to, the metadata rather, to do it. It's just a question of we're trying to figure out like a, the design of how we should build this. And that's something we're working with our design partners on. But essentially, yes. So it's typically, it's where people are asking questions which are at the right kind of level of complexity for Delphi to answer them. But the semantic layer just doesn't contain anything relevant to those questions. And so what will happen is the data team will see that Oh, this is how these these questions are being asked, but they know Delphi shouldn't answer it because they haven't exposed anything to Delphi that could be used to answer it. So what we want to show them is like, oh, here's this term, and maybe it's like um, basket conversion, and like we've not made anything in the semantic layer to evaluate basket conversion. Uh, and it's like it's almost like this is like how we could improve our product because this is something that's being asked for that's not you know if you think about the data as a product inside an organization. It's like uh, this is a good way to improve the product. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a cool way of looking at it. And and how does Delphi handle those questions right now? Like, is it pretty good at saying like, oh, there's not appropriate data to answer, or will it kind of like hallucinate some stuff? And if it's good, how did you how did you make it good at kind of like staying on track? And yeah, <laughs> this is the thing. It's it, it's it's required a, a lot of. <laughs> A lot of what's actually feeling more like normal engineering <laughs> to get these to work uh, to work well. Um, so yeah, we've got many many steps in our flow where you know we index the whole catalog from something like Q, and then we use thing methods like vector similarity to the question to see if there are actual relevant terms uh, that are relevant to the question. If we can't find anything that's within a certain threshold we'll say at that point, we don't think we've got anything, speak to your data team. Um, if we do have them, we do still explain what we're doing to the user, you know, we'll say, we're gonna pull this, and they can see the summary of what we're actually generating and it's it's readable in natural language. And they can say, well, this is still uh, not what I want. And so it, I, because we're opening up the box, I feel like, Delphi's not hallucinating. It's much more like an experience where you're talking to an analyst and analyst is trying to kind of guess what you want. Well, not even guess, but derive what you want from the data they know about. Very cool. Um, all right. Francisco Manuel, do you guys want to cap it off in terms of presentations and then we can go to a more panel discussion? Absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> So we're just going to present um, some corporations to an actual library that are in the same line of uh, using semantic search and adding dynamic pieces to the prompt uh, to improve either accuracy or cost. We see a great opportunity in, in LLM to SQL solutions to include domain-specific knowledge uh, when, the prompt, when the user already sent the question and using that question to incorporate 
different pieces of knowledge that might be relevant for the agent, either to make a better uh, query and get the correct result or make a more efficient thinking process. Uh, as practitioners with, with these um, with these uh, types of solutions, many times we see that uh, the chain or the agent is trying to get to the right answer. Maybe it gets to the right answer, but it takes a few tries and it's very, very consumptive uh, in, in terms of tokens and time. And we, we, would, we would like to try to avoid that as much as possible and having a straightforward build a query, send it, work well, and return. Uh, right now, the, the, the baseline solution is just sending all the, the table schema uh, with sample rows to the agent and then or to, to the chain and, and using that to build a correct query. But in some ways, you can be smarter than that. And there's a few things that we added to the library. Um, right now, it's, it's already been released that we would like to, to share. There's also other things that can be done. I, we think that this is a very fertile field to explore on how domain experts can add their knowledge so that the prompt gets built in a way that is really, really clear and explicit to the to the model. But this is a, a, a way to start. So Manu, Manu can take it from there probably. Yeah, I will I will present a very short notebook um, on on these two custom tools that we have we have built. All of this we'll share this notebook together with the with the recording. Um, and also this is uh, in a blog post that we wrote together with the Langchain team. And it's also in the SQL documentation for Langchain. So you'll probably find it there as well. Mostly the, the tricks on how to on how to build these custom tools. I'll focus more on the results, right? So I'm using the Chinook database for, for an example. Um, this is a question that can be answered using the standard SQL uh, agent. And we'll, we'll show how these two tools, which are first a tool that will uh, get similar examples. Um, so matches of user question to SQL queries that we know that work. Um, first, that tool, and also a tool that uh, checks the, the spelling of proper nouns. So how these two custom tools uh, improve the, the, age, the agent overall performance and, and accuracy, right? So just to showcase a question that can be answered with a standard SQL agent, um, we can see here like what, what is the what is the, the chain, right? First or the, or the process. Uh, first, using the SQL get similar examples tool, which is a retriever tool that gets, uh, as I said, similar examples to the question that the user asks. So, how many employees do we have in the database? It will bring uh, using the retriever. It will bring how many employees are there with its corresponding SQL query, and find the total number of invoices just because uh, the database, the the few shot database was short, so it's relevant but not not uh, similar enough with the corresponding SQL query. And the agent will choose, okay, I don't need to use all, like this agent also has the standard SQL uh, toolkit, but it decides not to use it because, okay, I already have in the few shots uh, an example that is similar enough. So I'll just use the, that query, run it, and it took uh, 13 seconds to do the whole process and 3,391 uh, tokens which running the same example with a standard SQL uh, agent with the standard SQL toolkit and everything, we see like the usual workflow that, that uh, anyone who has tried the agent has seen before, which is first listing the tables, then querying for the schema, for the employee table, uh, getting the sample rows, checking the syntax and running the query, right? And this spends um, a 60% increase in, in, in time. So actually the other, the other agent is, uh, around 40% uh, the, the, the time at the, at the, than the standard agent. And it also spends much more tokens. So it's more inefficient, both in, 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 in terms of time and in terms of, of tokens and cost, right? Which is um, two things that we want to, to clearly uh, improve in the, in the LLM to SQL solutions. And then there's another example, which is for spelling mistakes, right? So how, how many albums did Alice in Canes instead of Alice in Chains, which is the, the real, artist name, uh, how many albums did Alice in Kane's record? Um, and again, using the custom agent, we, we use first the Get Similar Examples tool, where we have, for example, Ira Smith, which is, um, which is many, uh, maybe a, a similar example, how many albums from Ira Smith? And then we have the other tool, which checks the, checks the spelling, right? So we have from Alice in Kane's, it retrieved the, the most similar artists, which are, are Alice in Chains and Alicia Duo. So 
In this way, the agent is able to correct the spelling mistake from the from the question from the user, and that is, I mean, that is key for filtering a column, right? In this case, the uh, the artist name. So it could get the right answer, which is one album. Um, and just to contrast, the standard SQL agent, which has the tools that we already discussed, won't be able to get the right answer because it it doesn't spot the the spelling mistake. So it uses the first tool, the second tool, etc. The, the query checker, and when it runs the query, it's tried to filter based on Alice in Keynes, which of course is not the right, the right name. So um, it doesn't get the right, the, it gets like the wrong answer, even like being much slower and spending a similar amount of tokens. So these are two examples of how including domain specific knowledge in, a, in forms of custom tools, which can now be appended to the, to the SQL agent, um, how including this domain specific knowledge increases accuracy and reduces time and, and, and tokens, right? So it's really powerful for, for improving from, from for improving the, the standard SQL agents. So open to questions, of course, if you if you have any. Awesome. Yeah, I mean so so I think I mean I, I think there's two really cool insights here. The the few shot examples and then kind of like the the the, the vector store retrieval high cardinality. And so maybe those are good places to start just like a general um, panel discussion and then kind of like open it up from there. Um, so uh, I guess first on the topic of kind of like few shot examples, um, you know, I think the implementation in the agent had a tool which could fetch relevant ones. There's also like maybe something else where you do that automatically and you automatically select them. And so I guess my question for you, Manuel and Francisco would probably be like, what are the trade offs there? And then my question for uh, David and Artem, have, have you guys seen kind of like few shot examples being used? Um, efficiently, effectively, when you have this semantic layer as well, and maybe we can start with Manuel and Francisco, and then go on from there. Yeah, that's that's cool. Uh, I think just including a few shot examples automatically would work. What we're doing now is like indicating to the agent to always use it. So it's kind of the same thing um, because the, the tool framework is quite flexible. So we just include it there, but. I think it is a good idea of always having a few short, a few, few short examples, since it's not usually it's not very token consumptive. It's quite hard to know like if that's a, in some specific case it will be useful or not. You just need to see, and and, and the agent can always ignore them if if, if, if it feels that you know, it's not uh, important enough or related enough. So I think it can be done automatically as well. And David, have have you guys seen kind of like few shot examples be helpful? Have you explored those at all, or or, or not yet? No, we haven't we haven't looked at them yet. Um, and you know, in a, we also haven't got to a point where we've explored fine tuning either. Like we've generally been using the models as is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, maybe that's another question for you for you guys, Manuel and Francisco. Have you looked at fine tuning at all? Do you think fine tuning would help here? Is this one of the situations where it would be good? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we have uh, explored fine tuning uh, using the GPT 3.5, and it's it's an interesting uh, field, and and there's there's some research around it. So it's it seems to be um, very good, but it's it's like for, for, for few short, using few short examples dynamically, you can get like 30, 40 uh, good examples and include them and you can, and you can play around with, with more things. For example, you can do like um, a thresholding with a score, so a similarity score in, in, this, in this example, we're just including the top two examples, right? Or top three examples. But you can do something like, um, okay, if I don't find any relevant examples based on a threshold, I just don't include them. Or if I find highly relevant examples, which would be like the, the example that I showed in the notebook, um, I just I just cut the the whole let's say sort of token inefficient prompt of having the, all of the tools that we have, and just saying okay using a using a like a like a simple prompt which is I have this query and I have this user question and this query I just want to adapt it to this other user question right because we know we have a very very close similarity. So that sort of playing around with the with the similarity score that we got from the from the retriever, um, you have it with a few shots. You don't have it with the with the fine tuning. That makes sense. 
myself. I, I haven't tried fine tuning, uh, so I haven't measured the, the performance or testing an accuracy. But I think, like um, at least in theory, I would do both. Like if I have a, a big enough data set, I would fine tune, and then like the few shot is much more context specific. So I maybe you, you can't rely on, on the model having. Uh, the, the, the examples you used in the training set as me in memory, like you remember them exactly. So it probably helps across the board to, to fine tune in terms, of, in terms of accuracy. But then again, like if you have a very relevant example in inference time, it's probably a good idea to include it because it has it, has it like very fresh in the prompt. So I think they are not mutually exclusive. I, I would be definitely very interested in seeing uh, how much fine tuning improves accuracy um, in, in a specific use case. I mean, I guess this, this, there is one way in which we are using it, which is kind of organically through user feedback in our product. So when Delphi gives an answer, you can say whether it's good or not with a thumbs up, thumbs down. And when Delphi does give an answer, uh, which is good, obviously that's then a prompt, which to have a good, which with a good answer that you could then you know, a prompt in association with the question that you could then put in as a, as in, in that few shot way. And that's, yeah, that's, the, that is one way in which we do improve Delphi's output. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. So you have some type of like active feedback loop. And when you say put back in, where, where do you put that? Like, is, is where do you put that in? Basically, do you, is, do you just have kind of like a section in the prompt that's like, here's some recent, here's some similar examples or something like that? Or is it a completely separate step in the chain where you first see if there's anything similar and then use that? Yeah, it's more like the latter, really. Okay. Interesting. Very cool. Um, and, and the second part of what you guys talked about was around kind of like handling spelling errors, which we can maybe generalize to like handling kind of like high cardinality columns when you know like if if a column's like a boolean it's really clear what the value should be or something like that but when you have a column that's like a name um i mean this isn't even getting into columns that are like all text values but let's just let's just stick with high cardinality for now whether we, you have a, a name or some sort of, of a person of an object or something and if you want to like filter on that you need to like spell it correctly and oftentimes users don't <laughs> um and, and so how, yeah, I mean, maybe starting with uh, RTM and David, how do you guys think about that? Have you seen anyone do kind of like clever things there? I think I can start from, you know, like cube semantic layer perspective is because we kind of provide that metadata information. So we want the consumers like uh, engineers who are building uh, sort of LLM based solutions to get as much context as possible, including the values of these dimensions, right? Like that can be mm -hmm. high cardinality. So we probably necessarily don't like deal with that, but we're thinking about more like what tools we need to provide for people to be able to fetch them. I think the, there's just a simple solution just to try to load all the values, you know, like and kind of put them. So that's what I see people doing right now. We are trying, and it's some, we actually spent some time with David recently talking about it, what kind of additional tools we can, kind of provide to, you know, developers that can, you know, like make working with this high cardinality dimensions more efficient. So one thing is that we can look at the query history and to see, you know, like what are dimensions kind of, you know, like a being, what values in these dimensions are being asked more frequently, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing and then sort of we can use that knowledge uh, for the context. The other thing is that Solutions like a semantic layer can index the values and to see what are the most popular values that are sort of being more relevant and sort of build a connection also between these values and provide that as a meta endpoint. So that's something we wanted to build at Cube, sort of, you know, like to kind of improve the, the context that we provide to uh, LLMs. So, so not just return all values, return the most popular ones. What about ones that are like, what about ones that are like similar to a query? or something like that. Like, is there any way to do that in kind of like a, like, like a, a, a quick way that doesn't, that doesn't add too much latency? 
because like so for an example of a way that would add a lot of latency if the, if you you could like index all the values create a vector store you could then have an llm kind of like parse out like oh i want to look up like the values most similar to like this person's name you know maybe that doesn't work great for that person's name because it's based on semantic similarity but maybe you have some other thing but you know that involves a call to a, a language model it's potentially long maybe that's fine maybe but then yeah like uh, I, you know, then you start getting going down the rabbit hole of what if I need to do this for two different columns and you kind of get to something that looks kind of like the agent that Francisco and Manuel kind of like came up with basically where it's searching kind of like the vector store and doing that, which is, I think yields pretty good results, but it takes a lot of time. So like, is there a way to meet in the middle any, any way? Uh, yeah, I think, um, and you know, like I know that David is spending a lot of time thinking about that problem, but, uh, I think what Cube can do is uh, we can sort of provide like some API that can, you know, like the LLM can query during the query time to get some cached values that can be kind of close to that specific dimension. Because we would probably, it would take a lot of latency just for us to go into re-index everything again. So if we would have something already cached, we would be able to quickly provide that. But uh, I think that's a sort of an only option for the additional sort of semantics during the query time. And then the rest should be sort of, you know, like did in a, as a background job, right? Like where you do have an indexing, you're putting that in a vector store and like just kind of dealing with it later. But for like a quick inquiry context, that's something that potentially we can provide on our end, but that's, that's a really interesting problem to solve. Yeah, and like, like Rajan said, like the things that are most important there is like, how you can't do it for everything for a specific column, and especially with with a complex like sem semantic layer deployment, they could have many, many hundreds of these columns which have uh, millions of uh, records each. And so then thinking about which ones are used in filtering a lot, and which ones have a lot of records associated with them, that's really important. Like you've got to do that. There's no magic. That's that's the that's that's what that's the way it has to work. Francisco Manuel, anything to add from your guys' perspective when you were playing around with this? I was just thinking like what would be a good way to since the, the, the high latency part is always the LLM call, like how, how can you, for example, extract uh, if there is a proper noun in the sentence without using an LLM? Because that would save some time, right? You would get the, the proper noun, send it to whatever vector store you made, and get the result without having to have an LLM call, which has that latency. I'm not sure if there's like some kind of very quick model, name, name entity recognition model that can be used for that. Maybe a model can be trained for that. But in, in everything, like uh, from my view, is um, trying to make as least LLM calls as possible without decreasing the functionality. I try to do the same things without LLMs. Like that's my, my train of thought. I'm not sure it, if it works. Um, all right, we can probably jump into a lot of user questions now. So drop them in the chat on the right. First one is probably most for you, Arjun. And let me click on it. Is the semantic layer built for a relational database? How about NoSQL and unstructured data sources? Isn't GPT-4 already very good at code interpreter for that kind of data? Um, so yeah, this is maybe a little bit more color on like what exactly Cube is um, and, 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 and how it interacts with different types of databases. Yeah, uh, so Cube is, and it gives a, it's a semantic layer, right? It's, it's built for, I would say, a tabular or relational data right first um it's possible you know like to use different query engines like a presto or trina to potentially maybe query a different you know like a type of the data but the presto and query, trina they would itself it will create a sql interface right so cube is always it sits on top of sql query engine or sql database or sql warehouse and i think that's sort of we are where we can add value and that we are really being focused on that specific kind of use case. And I think there are like a lot of really good tools for like more unstructured data and index and constructed data, but Cube as a semantic layer is really being focused on the relational data. 
And I think it's it's interesting because like, you know, I've seen Cube integrates with Mongo, right? But then like Archim said, it, it's gonna write SQL. So if effectively all you're doing is shredding out uh the values from the JSON format data and making them into SQL like tables to then use with the semantic layer. So there's not really a hell of a lot of difference in actually what ends up happening. That's true, yeah. We we integrate with Mongo, but we actually required to run the Mongo BI connector, which is sort of a proxy, for, yeah. so like MySQL proxy on top of Mongo. I heard that Mongo might introduce some sort of, sort of a native SQL support. So, you know, like in that case, we would be able to support Mongo natively, but then again, it's always SQL, right? So if the NoSQL database like data store will introduce a SQL interface, then we would be able to support that. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right, this one's for Manuel. Do you have any ideas how to make spelling mistakes more generic so you don't have to predefine which columns should be used to verify proper nouns? So yeah, the, so when you were doing it for, I think we did it, so when you did the app, it was over this, like the Chinook data set, which is a data set of like song artists and things like that. So did you predefine kind of like which columns should be used to, to kind of like verify spelling on? Yeah, I should probably take that one because it was a bit myself. Um, we hard coded that, so we just, you know, we saw artists, you know, customer names, employee names. So those are probably proper nouns that can be misspelled. I think this question is really, really interesting. I thought about this, so I don't think there's a straight answer. I think there are very, very nice heuristics to get started in this path. For example, one thing I've been thinking about is doing some kind of like rule-based approach where you're trying to see if the columns first are string, second are not categorical, so you, the cardinality is high, third are not very long, and max two words, for example, like name and surname. And in that way, you can like deep dive and like you can have like a funnel where, where you're left with a few columns that are highly likely to be uh, proper nouns or, or just like entities that can be misspelled. And you can make a vector with, with, with those. You can also check if, if they are uh, they have cap in caps the first letter, but you're assuming that the, the data is, is neat, which is not always the case. But I think like this first approach of like making a few rules, not very long, is a string, doesn't have a, a low cardinality, leaves a subset of highly likely columns uh, that, that are the subset that you're looking for. But there's another thing that I was thinking of that I think is quite interesting, which is it's highly likely that there's like this 80-20 uh, priority in which things you want to get right and which, you know, which columns are not very important and are not, are not queried uh, often. And if you just do that run, that, that approach, you will be uh, using all, all the, the, the examples of these proper nouns or entities in the same vector store. So you will be mixing a lot of information and you're lowering, you're decreasing the probability of getting the right result back. So one, one cool approach, I think, again, following this IT20 rule is selecting the columns that you most care for, that you want you know, to, get, to get that spelling right, maybe two or three, three or four. And then for these, having a separate vector store and in the tool, having that vector store being queried first with a specific threshold. If, if values are returned, then use those. And then maybe append values from the, from the long tail of, of columns um, to, to, the, to the return results from that tool. So in that, in that way, you're, you're prioritizing, like if, if, if the user is speaking about one of the entities that I most care for, it's going to be well-spelled. It's a small vector store with, with a constrained set of results. And then you have the long tail one, which has a higher degree of error. So in that way, you can you know, prioritize having high accuracy over columns that are most, most important. Kind of related. Okay, so this is this is a we're running low on time, and I think there's two good questions that I want to get to. So, jumping to the next one, a little bit related to retrieval, but in a different way. Curious if anyone has thought about uh, through embeddings a data dictionary for retrieval. So basically, like if you have if the table does have metadata, embedding that and then retrieving the relevant things rather than retrieving like the whole schema or something like that. And I guess maybe a generalization of this is what do you do when the schema is really big? <laughs> How are you guys handling that? Um, maybe we can start with David and then go to Francisco and Manuel from there. Yeah, so we've seen some like gigantic um, semantic layers that we've worked on, like typically like um, quite mature looker projects have been 
you know, huge with many similar named columns and similarly named explores. So we've had to find ways to, you know, on setup, say, oh, choose which explores you you want to see. And like with Cube, when like views are made with views, we'd use the same thing, like which views do you want to offer you to look at? And then you kind of have this step firstly where Delphi is choosing which one is the most appropriate to use, and then it operates there in that space and not everywhere, because otherwise it's just too, it's just so likely to go wrong. Manuel Francisco, have you guys seen anything? Yeah, I, I was, I was going to <laughs> wait if Francisco wanted to talk. But yeah, I, I thought about it, like, it's really, really interesting. Um, Mostly, and, and this is kind of generalized to to the the, the actual um, the actual topic of the blog post we wrote, and and the whole idea behind these custom tools, which is including domain specific knowledge and empowering uh, your, your your solution with domain specific knowledge. And and this is a clear example, right? Do we do we need to include the whole schema of the tables with with columns that sometimes we know that won't be used um, or or, in, or the encoding or like a lot of information that is automatically retrieved with the tools that the agent has right now, but maybe are not relevant. And maybe it's more relevant to include a short description of the table or a short de description of the columns. And you can in dynamically include it uh, with this with this retrieval tools, um, reducing prompts, uh, reducing tokens, sorry, uh, time, and, and also like being much more accurate, right? And this is another example of, of how to include domain specific knowledge that the person who is building the solution Pass and, and, and adds infinite value uh, to the to the let's say vanilla SQL agent, right? Um, so so this is a very very uh, like another idea of, of very similar to the few shots actually. Uh, you can even have like fallbacks, right? So um, have a first first uh, layer that gets a description of the table and the columns, and if the LLM isn't able, if the agent isn't able to to build the right query, okay, then I go. And query the whole schema, but just if I need it, right? Uh, not not always. So it's very very interesting. All right, and we're running low on time, but this is a very open ended question, and so uh, I don't know I don't know how concrete of things we're going to have to say about this. But can you? And I guess this is this is prompted off of David's kind of like comment, and so maybe we can start with him, and that might be all we have time for. But can you talk through some of the engineering changes that we'll need to see to migrate us from answering easy medium enterprise questions to medium hard ones? Yeah, and again, I probably said this once or twice. There's no magic, right? The the way that this has to be done is through expression. So like, Archim and I have talked about things like. Uh, metric trees and metric chains, like describing how metrics affect each other, you know, and things so that it allows you to answer more abstract questions because you have something to traverse that will help you ex answer the question. Um, when it comes to those very abstract questions, I think there is an element where the reason why you're asking that question is because you're trying to make a pretty bold move as an organization. And when you're doing that, it's slow. And when you're doing that, there's potentially millions on the line. And actually having a human do this with care is going to be what you would do anyway, even if you did ask some LLM tool about this. So I, I wonder, you know, if there's like diminishing value in trying to build some system that was so powerful that it could answer those really complex questions. Um, but, you know, that's just all the way I'm thinking right now. Awesome. All right, well, that's all we've got time for. Thank you guys for joining. It was a, it was a pleasure to have you on. Thank you everyone for, for tuning in and the great questions. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll put this recording up so that everyone can uh, rewatch it and learn from all the insights. Thank you guys. Thanks for having us.